Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Mike. Um, so it's, uh, I sat through three school leaving assemblies. My, my children, three boys, went through Kashima High School. Big school, as some of you will know. And as the, as the students progressed across the stage there, most of them said they were going to university, and that alone made me unhappy or uneasy. And um, I never heard the word agriculture. And yet Kashima is the school I went through, and I'm in agriculture. What I also didn't hear was, I didn't hear anyone mention any of the trades really, everyone was going to university. And uh, I heard one, one year I remember one young lad said, sort of, I'm going to become a plumber and I turned to my wife and said, he'll be rich. Remember that next time you complain about a, a bill for plumbing. But um, yeah, but I've, I've sort of, as I always do with titles, I sort of change things around a little bit and, and, and really focusing today on, are you gambling if you direct kids towards agriculture? And I'm going to cover a few bases there. I can't answer all the questions in that respect, but I'll see if I can cover some, some ground with, with this talk. So first of all, what's the market for agriculture like? Very hard to say categorically. It's one of those industries actually where a lot of the jobs are word of mouth. You know, there's a job going there, you take that or apply for this. Some of that's a little bit New Zealand inkish too. New Zealand's a bit like that. that Job advertisements don't match where jobs actually necessarily are. But um, you go into Seek, which is one of the sites. You can go into Trade Me Jobs as well too. I don't think it's such a good site, but don't quote me on that one. And you pull out figures. So when I did the search, just using agriculture as a keyword in Seek, um, I came up with 1,091 jobs in New Zealand. And because we've got a fairly fluid labour market between Australia and New Zealand, in fact most of my students when they complete at Lincoln disappear off to Australia for a bit of time because they can earn more money. Um, there were 5,600 jobs um, in agriculture in Australia. Come down that list of figures there, it's a bit intimidating, but uh, more than half of those jobs are paying over $70,000 a year, the ones that are advertised. About a third of them pay more than $100,000 a year. And as teachers, you're probably feeling a little bit uneasy about that. It's like, oh, why didn't I do agriculture? And I didn't look at these jobs specifically, but there's 40 jo 47 jobs in Australia that are being advertised in the $350,000 range. I didn't look at those jobs because I might be tempted to jump on the plane or something. But I think just taking that message there, that a third of the jobs advertised in SEEK are prepared to pay $100,000 upwards for people in agriculture. So... We get headlines too. And these are just some of them. This is a really quick Google search. You could do this one here. If you look at that one up there on the top right, unprecedented demand for agriculture workers. Unprecedented. Six job vacancies per graduate. The output of students with skills in agriculture in New Zealand is frankly pathetic. It's tiny. And um, they are in high demand. If we look at Lincoln specifically, and I'm not here to sell Lincoln necessarily, we have the highest employment rates of, uh, of, for our graduates of any university in New Zealand. We're about 5% ahead of anyone else. And a large part of that reflects that, uh, that at Lincoln, agriculture is such a large part of what we do. But the headlines are starting to get more and more dire if you look at some of the words there, and as I said, that was easy to find. But, 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 how many young people, or careers teachers like yourselves, genuinely understand agriculture. You can put your hand on your heart and say, yeah, I'm really there, I'm in that space. And therefore, can you actually clearly say to students what's driving the demand or, or explain to them why agriculture is so important to them or could be good for them, okay? Um, part of the problem here is, and we know this, and New Zealand's become strongly urbanised, is that in westernised countries, we've all moved to town. It's happened on a large scale in China too, I've watched it there. But across the world, people have urbanised. So their food now comes from a supermarket. we are evil places in many ways. I teach students a lot about supermarket economics. But the bottom line is, I don't think people have a huge or, or good understanding of where their food comes from. They see shelf upon shelf of food. They all complain about high prices at the moment. But they're not particularly well equipped to understand where it's coming from, why it might be expensive, why tomato prices have just plummeted, and why... Um, Avocados are quite low in price at the moment. They don't understand even seasonality of production systems. And then there's other things like dear old Mr Putin and his little war here, which is going to really confound 
world food supply because the Ukraine's, I think it's the seventh largest producer of wheat in the world, and that's going to have a major effect on food trade globally. It, it has already. So, I'm going to test you out first of all. How much are we, collectively, you as careers teachers, parents too in the room, how much are we prepared to gamble on things we don't understand? Because I've just made the point that I don't think we understand agriculture. I'll get a show of hands on this one. We might bring the lights up for this guys at the back there. But um, how many of you can genuinely say that you have a good understanding of what's involved in software engineering? Put your hands up if you can say that. That's pleasing. There's a smattering of hands there. I have no idea what it's about. I'll be blunt. But there's a large number of jobs there. Okay. And the word geek always seems to pop up fairly quickly in the conversation, which I think is quite frightening too, because I've got friends in that business, they have a lot of money and they're not geeks. Um, how many of you can say that you've got a very clear understanding, and excuse my pronunciation, I'm as deaf as opposed to a tail Nari. How many can clearly say good understanding of it? A smattering of hands again. So then this is where it really bites. How many of you can genuinely say that you have a good understanding of agriculture, both within New Zealand and globally? That's pretty good. I think you're being a little bit uh, overrating yourselves, but we'll test you out on this one. <laughs> Let's see, because here's a little quiz to see how much you really are comfortable outside of your little urban school zone, but I do appreciate some of you come from rural schools and you probably have a really good understanding. So, this is a um, my kid could draw that type situation, this picture here. How many of you, because this is taking you outside of your comfort zone, this is about art. How many of you would be prepared, and guys, bring the lights up again, because I want everyone to be able to laugh at themselves on this one. How many of you, thanks, up the back, yeah, how many of you prepared, uh, would you be prepared to pay for this painting? How many of you would give me 50 cents if I had that painting here? Oh, yeah? Good, good. How many of you would give me $5? Oh, okay. How many of you would give me 500 Okay, and how many of you would give me 50000 for that painting? <laughs> so there's one or two in the room that perhaps understand a little bit about art, but it's to make the point to you that most of us don't actually understand art, but there's a lot of students going into art and creative design in New Zealand. I'll get to that soon. Here it is. Yeah. Now is the hour. We must say goodbye. Now that last sold for 117,500. So if someone said to me, John, 50,000, I'd say, yep, I'd be off to the if possible, wherever I could get that. I'd buy it tomorrow. And that was 2016. I suspect that artwork's now worth a million dollars if you could buy it. It's still a little bit of a my kid could paint that type situation. I agree. I don't know the value proposition in art. But the point there is most of you don't actually understand art and art value. So how can you genuinely, unless you're involved in agriculture implicitly, which would be some of the careers teachers here from rural schools, how can you genuinely say you understand agriculture? And I say that because the snapshot of agriculture that we see in the mainstream media, sorry Mike, sitting over there, the snapshots we see of agriculture are at best fanciful and at worst quite horrible. So, what are those in the industry know? Now, pro, pro, you can see this, it's the text is a bit small down the bottom there, but that's because I don't necessarily want you to read it all. But um, we know agriculture is growing in New Zealand. Annually, we do a projection of where agriculture is going and what it's worth to the country. And that projection earlier in the year said, oh, we were going to earn about 52.1 million, uh, billion, not million, billion, 52.1 billion from our primary industries to the year 30 June. But it actually increased. Um, it was more than a billion dollars more than predicted. So our agricultural exports, against the background of us having um, headline inflation at high levels, talk of recession, those sorts of things, our export of agricultural products is increasing. And what's more, because they sold overseas, they actually generate a lot of foreign income for us. It's easier to sell things when our dollars are low. So farmers and people involved in agricultural production systems, meat companies, dairy companies, and so on, are actually quite happy with the lower dollar. They don't let on to that too often. Now, there's still jobs in the primary sector. Take the second point here. There's still jobs in the primary sector where you could get that job without any form of post-secondary um, qualification. They're still there, you could find them, and I know people that go into those jobs and they love them. They've got a rewarding um, uh, uh, job to do and they actually enjoy them. I won't miss them. But in the red area, in that second point there, much of the growth will be in highly skilled jobs. Agriculture is actually looking for people 
with high levels of qualification. Now, a little snippet of information there. We know teachers as a professional group, uh, quite highly qualified, most of you in this room will have a degree of some kind. That is also true of farmers in New Zealand. They're highly qualified. I know at least four farmers who have PhDs okay, in animal production. Those are the ones that I've taught. So in 2012, it was estimated that 44% of employees in the primary sector needed some sort of post-school qualification. Now, by 2025, they're saying it needs to be 62% there. You probably can't read the fine print there, but we want technically able people. I work in an industry where <clears throat> technology dominates what we do. We go out on farm, when I do go on farm, with multi-million dollar technological developments. Those computer programmers that I talked about who I don't understand, I just rely on them doing the magic, but so we can improve the efficiency of the systems, reduce the carbon footprint, those sorts of things. So most of us don't understand these figures. They don't understand this industry that's massive, that underpins about 82% of our export economy. Most of us don't actually understand it, especially urban New Zealanders. So, how effectively then are we selling agriculture? Okay. How effectively do we sell it at the primary level? Well, from my daughter's experience in a primary school, it's never talked about, it's not mentioned. Secondary, Cashmere High School, as I said, I never heard the word agriculture mentioned over three end of year assemblies. A travesty. Not a criticism of Cashmere, probably a bigger system problem there. Tertiary level training in agriculture, agribusiness, and food related industries. How often or how effectively are we selling it? Okay. These are the phrases I continue to hear. Ah, oh, yeah, agriculture for dummies. Okay. Um, oh, three sciences, maths and English, are more important. Possibly they are, possibly they're not. Low paid jobs, I hope I've dispelled that myth now. <clears throat> not if you are academic. Read what I've put at the bottom there. From my perspective, as a professor of agricultural science, as someone who's been in the business now for nearly 40 years, someone who works internationally, publishes internationally, has done a lot of science, sounds like I'm just bragging, um, I actually find those statements there completely untrue and actually bloody insulting. I put the word freaking untrue, we can excuse that now because that's Ruby Tui who used that phrase on national TV two weeks ago. So, but I find it actually insulting that that's the way that people still talk about agriculture and yet I hear that week by week coming from people. I hope it doesn't come out of any of your mouths in the future. We actually want the best people, that's what we want. But, <clears throat> and we've, I've listened to some of the talks today, do we even know, and I know people are going to touch on this in the future too, do we even know how to get into the hearts and minds of teenagers? They will make decisions with their hearts and minds, and it was shown to me once that a career's event down in, in Invercargill that they probably also think with their stomach sense this next phrase there. I've raised three boys, and I'm happy to say that like most parents, I had no clue what they're thinking at any given time. I still don't. I'll text them, I get one word answers and think, what the hell are they about? Um, other than when they're standing with the fridge door open. You've all probably seen that or understand that thing there. And I put that slide in front of my 18-year-old who's still at home with me, and he went, no, nah, I'm not thinking anything most of the time then. It's just a habit to open the fridge door and look into it. <laughs> and then he stops, he goes, and when are we going to get some decent food? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> point made. So, however, when you get past all those prejudices, the dummies, agricultures, and getting into the heads of teenagers. We often sell agriculture, and what we see, the images, mainstream media and social media, we see pictures like this. So if you Googled agriculture and then you click on the images tab, you'd see images like that. And the question I put to you is, what does that say to young people? Now, down on the sort of the bottom right, down here for you guys, um, you can see, or actually in the middle left too, you can sort of see some New Zealand outdoor shots there that I've purloined off the internet. And they look great. It's sort of bolt hole stuff for us as adults and older people. We feel at one with New Zealand when we see those rural scenes. It's like, this is good. Hope they're not buggering it up. You know, and that's what we perceive farming. But just think about it. What, does those, what do those scenes there say to a young person who you might be talking to tomorrow, well, I think it's Monday, whenever, um, <coughs> about agriculture? And I suspect what those images say to young people, having talked to a few over the years, is this. They say if you go into agriculture, you'll be lonely. 
because that's what all those scenes are about. They're big, expensive landscapes. And, you know, it appeals to me. I'm not that antisocial, but it sort of appeals to me to have that landscape. But I don't think that appeals to young people. I don't think those views <coughs> of New Zealand actually appeal to young people going into agriculture at all. And if you think about it, and I was listening to the previous workshop session on mental health and well-being, young people, our school leavers, um, they're at a time of their lives where I think they're starting to engage with the world, with each other, they're looking for lifetime partners, these sorts of things. They're in that social space. They're not in the space that says, now you've got to go out and live in the middle of the back of beyond from nowhere and be lonely, okay? You end up as what I've put there, Nigel, no friends. I hope he's not in the crowd. And I put it small enough that he can't read it, but there'll be apologies to a latter speaker there. But I don't think kids want to get into that space of, oh, and now you're out in the world and you're going to be as lonely as all hell. I very rarely see images like this one, these ones, here. <clears throat> and yet this is the reality to me, because I work in this business. I've been in this business, as I said, for nearly 40 years. It's people. Very, very tight communities. Actually, <clears throat> much tighter communities in agriculture than I've ever seen in urban New Zealand. I once, long ago, lived in Christchurch. Hated it. People build fences to cut themselves off from the community. I do not understand that. Now I live in Littleton. You probably carry your prejudices about Littleton because apparently everyone there is arty and music-y, uh, opposed to the scientists. But um, I love it as a town. We don't have fences. We congregate on our main street. We talk. It is community. That's what makes Littleton tick as a place. But it, community and agriculture is also remarkably strong, even though geographically they can be miles apart. There's very, very tight communities. But you really see pictures of people. If we did that, if we made that change of saying, actually, you're going to agriculture, you're going to be part of a community, and we've really seen that this year as we've um, seen post-COVID and we've tried to drag our students back to university. <clears throat> when we finally got them back, and that took a fair bit of work on my part as a coordinator for the degree programs, when I finally got them back, they suddenly understood the importance of being part of a community, a group of students at Lincoln, and they're a whole lot better adjusted because of that. So down there on your bottom right, um, that's a picture that I took about three weeks ago now, uptailing lambs. I do get my fingernails dirty at times. The age range in that photo there is from a 20-year-old young woman through to a grumpy old 70-year-old and, and a 60-year-old with me behind the camera. Great range of people there, some 30s, some 40s, doing a job, chatting, having great fun. It was about a 14-hour day. I came home completely shattered and slept for about another 12 hours after that. But there was that sense of community, of oneness, of attachment. The young ones learned all day in a non-threatening environment. And we didn't assess them at the end. It was more along the lines of, oh, don't do that, uh, do that, and so on. It's, it's a little bit abrupt at times. But they, the ones there, and there's two of them there, there that were in their 20s, felt completely attached and connected into that community out in the hills in North Canterbury. Here's some other <coughs> interesting statistics. Okay, Now, this comes from Tertiary Education Commission. I know Tim Fowler's here. We're going to talk soon. But... Um, over 40% more students are in the tertiary sector studying creative arts. They're obviously not doing very well if you guys went through that system because not many of you have picked the Macan before. But there's 40% more students, and that's across levels, starting at level one, right up to PhD level, 40% more doing creative um, arts. And I'd ask you the very simple question, where are the jobs in that? More frighteningly, over 670% or 6.7 times more students, nearly 40,000, are involved in study of society and culture. Well, it's not, not an unimportant area, but are the jobs there? That's what they're going into. So as they parade across the stage at Cashmere High School, I hear BA, B whatever, you know. But I see a lot of social science stuff in there, but I'm not convinced necessarily where the jobs in that are against a background of us knowing that the shortage of teachers and nurses, which I don't think they come into that society and culture type thing, it's a different category again. But a massive oversupply of graduates in that area, but they're still getting the message to go into that. Most of that is degree level and beyond, I might add. Highlighted in yellow here is a very, very interesting statistic to me. Maori constitute 28%, 28% of tertiary students that are studying agriculture and horticulture. In some parts of the tertiary sector, it is less than 
Now, if you think about New Zealand's population as a whole, it's inequitably distributed. But Maori sit at about 17% of our population, more by proportion in Northland than Southland. 17%, and yet within the tertiary sector, it's 28% Maori. I would say that's an absolute success story. Now, it's not a complete success story because they're typically in the level one, two, three, four, and five qualifications, not the higher level stuff. But I would make the point that once you get people into agriculture, providing you've got an effective staircase mechanism going upwards, then we can pull Maori and other students up to higher level study as and when we need them. But I think that's a success story. 28%, and I'll put another figure next to that, about 30%, 30% of our sheep meat and beef exports come off Maori owned and operated properties. So that's quite interesting too. They're actually fully engaged with our land based economy, our agriculture, our horticulture. Huge incorporations like Maca too are very successful primary industry um, companies. Flip side of the coin, I won't dwell on this, but very few people from um, Asia or the Pacific Islands want to study agriculture because they're sufficiently close to where they came from that they equate agriculture with subsistence farming. So being poor, getting just enough money and food to feed yourself, as opposed to being in a massive business like it is in New Zealand. So, this is my final slide. If establishing a great career in agriculture is gambling, then, now deceased Prime Minister David Longy was right, because he said straight out, agriculture is a sunset industry. That means you're happy to start to dex, because agriculture produces food. What is more, in New Zealand, where, uh, and we saw this through COVID, as tourism wound down to a very low level, a lot of domestic tourism, that's a great thing, but agriculture kept exporting, horticulture kept exporting, our seafood industries kept exporting. Without those, we would be a third world country, and very rapidly. Those farm products that we export allow us to purchase some of the luxuries in life, such as oh, vaccines and other drugs that probably keep half of you alive, just like me. That's what it's paying for. So I'll leave it there. And Mike, do we have a bit of time for questions? Yeah, before we go, time for one. Just, uh, yeah, time for a question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a proud Lincoln graduate, and as a proud father of two Lincoln graduates, and the proud father of another potential Lincoln graduate, when, once he finishes his, his uh, gap year, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which he's working as a 19-year-old managing the stock on a deer start in Southland. Yep. As a proud agriculture teacher for the last 34 years, I've got a few bones to pick. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Number one is we can't get agriculturally trained teachers into secondary schools. Absolutely. And, and That's part the of problem. that is the supply and demand. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And part of that is pathways through teachers training universities because they're aligned with Canterbury, which doesn't really care. Yep. Um, no, I agree. Um, and, and the salary structures too would, would make it if you step backwards, given sort of the salary ranges we're seeing in agriculture now, sadly. Se second yeah, point I'd like yeah. to make is that social sustainability is, and you pointed out on this, is crucial for young people, but one of the biggest providers in the agricultural sector, the dairy industry, persists in having 11 days on, three days off, when the young people can't get their social interactions on their weekends. Yep. yep. So that, that what I see are two of the biggest things that the industry needs to deal with as far as attracting young people into it. The dairy industry has been quite slow to the party and I agree young people typically don't respond to four o'clock starts if they're milking cows. That's a, a key thing and, and that's often why milkers come in from overseas. There are structural issues, I don't deny that in the industry. The dairy industry especially has been perhaps a little bit too corporate, too much of an eye on the market and value proposition for investors and not on the people. And I think it's Probably, I hope there's no dairy representatives in the audience, but I think they've probably muddied the water. The sheep and beef industry is actually quite a bit different. Far better community around that. But look, I didn't say there's no structural problems. They're there. 
and yet just getting Air Corps teachers into what is, I think it's a fantastic curriculum and the standards are brilliant, they're being revised currently, but there's work to do, but the kids should be in it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thanks to John Hick.